Okay, module two, objective three. So we're going to start looking at ways to manage and store the data that we have been collecting. So again, it's obviously going to look at um, geodatabases and other data types and other ways that we can organize our data and maintain it. So, um, so the objectives for this particular uh, topic is looking at geodatabases, looking at spatial and non-spatial data in those geodatabases and the organization of them, and then also describing domains and subtypes. So a geodatabase, we just finished talking about that in the previous objective, and we spent a fair amount of time on it. Um, but it is a collection of our geographic data sets. So we have all this data, and we're going to kind of collect it all together in one spot, just so that we can find it easily. It is the native data structure for ArcGIS. So we use geodatabases all the way through ArcGIS, and it's just, it, it's just the way that it kind of fundamentally is used. Then um, the neat thing about geodatabases, we can have small ones, we can have really large ones, and so they're really flexible, and that's also very helpful for any kind of GIS project. And finally, the primary data format for editing and data management is a geodatabase. So if we're trying to look at our data and we're trying to view it, we're trying to analyze it, we got to use it for different analysis techniques it's defaulted that it needs to be in geo, a geodatabase. So the architecture of these geodatabases at a very basic level is that it is based on databases. Um, so there, it's a, a database management system. So if you have any background in databases, there you go. Um, we have tables and attributes that store the schema, the rules, the base, the spatial attribute data, um, and if it's the, these tables and attributes, the tables with the attributes are for every data set, whether it be a feature class um, or even some, there's, there's information that's linked within feature data sets. So we can use SQL, structure query language, to filter and to like pull information from and analyze it to, to actually like view that data. It kind of works in the background as you click a mouse, but you can use SQL to also use to, to access your data. There's user defined tables, so you can go through and manage your own tables in one or more data data tables. There's also system tables which have the schema of data sets and they have the rules and relationships kind of linking it all in the background. So some fundamentals of geodatabases is that there's three primary data sets. So there's feature classes, there's raster data sets, and there's tables. Everything has a table that's associated with it. So all the um, attributes are definitely found in a table for vector. And raster data sets also have information that's going to show up as a table. The spatial representations of geographic data sets are stored as vector or raster. So again, um, we've talked a lot about those. You can use either in a geodatabase. But when you go and start a map, it's the very first set, the very first step that you have to follow in order to kind of get going on your project. So you, you need to design it and you need to build it. So it's something that requires a little bit more thought than just slapping together data. Another key thing with it though is that you can add to it or you can extend it. You can, again, it's very flexible. So you're able to work with it in different ways. So kind of going diving a little bit in, into the feature classes as a review from module one. Um, a feature class is a collection of common features. So again, points are all together, like a certain type of point is all together in one feature class. Certain polygons is in another, annotations are in another. So it's, it's all different feature classes. And each of those have, each feature class will have a common set of attributes. So for example, if I look at a tree and I have a feature class of trees, then it's going to have a name. It might have a of age. It might have the canopy height. It might have the canopy width. So you can look at all the different kinds of attributes, but everything will relate that way. It's not like it's suddenly going to be man-made or not. It's, it's still a tree. It's going to not be natural, or it's going to be natural, not man-made. 
So another fundamental thing about geodatabases is these tables that I've been mentioning. So every row has the same field. So you can see that we have some sort of object and across everything is either filled in. You might have empty cells in here and that's okay. Um, it, it might just say no data or it might be empty and it still can work with that. So you don't necessarily have to panic about that. So every row is the same object and it has all the information about the object. Every column is one type of data. So for example, parcel ID or owner name or sale price, all of those is one type of data as it goes down. And it, it's identified as some sort of data type. So for example, an integer. So parcel ID is an integer. We have decimal numbers. So maybe the sale price would actually have decimals. We have dates. We have text, which is names. So we can use many different kinds of data types to be able to describe our feature. What, what's really neat about tables, though, is that it has the ability to have relationships. So I can go, go through and I can identify, for example, one particular feature or one particular attribute. And I can say this attribute, can I find that attribute in another table? And then it will connect the two using functions and operators. So we can store all of these properties um, of these dif different geographic objects based on two different tables. And they don't have to combine into one, but they can but it allows us to manage those relationships in a different manner. So the main elements you're going to see in a geodatabase is the tables, right? So always important. And then the feature class itself and also raster data sets. So if you, so some maps do not have raster data, but a lot of them do. So you'll have that as a, because it shows the continuous data of the area. So those are the three main elements. You don't need to have all three three in order for it to be a database, but um, a, a strong geo database for a project would have all three. So again, we have three geo database types that are functional with ArcGIS Pro. And I've mentioned this in the previous objectives. So we have the file geo database, the mobile geo database and the enterprise geo database. So just as a review from the previous lecture, a file geodatabase is the default. So it just goes right to that. It is supported in all kinds of GIS systems, um, the, the, the idea of it. It's scalable. You can use, it's an unlimited size of data. So you can use as much as you like. Um, you can have more than three, 300 million features within a data set. And the data sets can scale to one terabyte and they can be further scaled to like four terabytes or 256 terabytes per file per file that's not the <laughs> not just one um that, that's not the whole thing it's just per file so he, as i mentioned it can be huge 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 files they, they are easy to create it defaults to it it creates it for you already so you don't even have to think about it and then there's um, multiple file geodatabases can be used across multiple projects anytime and be accessed anytime. So if you have a geodatabase, you can just bring it in. It's like, hey, I've got this data already and I just need a piece of it. So I'm going to bring that part in. So it's really good that way. So the mobile geodatabase, I've mentioned this a few times. This is one that you'll also be using. And it has a very simple structure. So you're able to um, work with it easily. You, it, it leverages domains and subtypes and, and um, relationships. So you're able to still do some functionality with the mobile geodatabase. It's not as powerful as the file, but it, it does have everything online, right? So you're able to put everything online. And it's, it, you can create, display, query. So the basic, or basic um, operations that you can do with it. And you can edit features as well. So if something was done incorrectly or m missing an attribute, you can add it. And it's portable across operating systems. So again, you can use it on a Mac or a, a Windows system or a Linux system. So it, it, it's got a lot of flexibility. And a single file can hold up to two terabytes. So it's not as big as what the file geodatabase is, but it still can hold a fair amount of data. And finally, we, you can share it via email or USB, or you can just share it through ArcGIS Online, and uh, other people can come in and edit your map as well. 
And then finally, the third one, which we will not be doing in our class, is enterprise geodatabases. So it's really meant for really large data sets that just have a constant, they're constantly being worked on. And it, it allows for multi-user environments, so people across the world can use it, um, depending on the company you're with. You can have versioned workflows, so again, a versioning option for use instead of you having to set it up yourself. It's got a relational data stru database structure, so that again just provides additional um, an, an additional way of analysis for that, and it's very high performance, so it manipulate it very quickly and easily. So that kind of summarizes all the different types of geodatabases. So now we're going to talk about domains. So this one's really powerful. It's really fun because it allows us to limit error and allows us to really control what goes into the attributes. So it, it sets the rules and you get to set them. So, and there again, it also allows for a reduction in consistency errors too. So you can see here that we have some sort of domain that has been set. It has a description. We can say what kind of field it's going to be. We can have certain codes that is allowed to use. And there's a, something called split and merge, which we're going to talk about in a second. So domain properties, we have these four things, name and description, which is basic, basically so you can access it. It has a field name, a field type. So what is what kind of data is it? A domain type. So how are you limiting the data? And then there's also split and merge policies that we can use. So name and description, that's pretty straightforward. I give a good name so I know what the parameter is. You can't use any special characters, so that's really important. Make sure you don't use any like asterisks or anything like that. Uh, the name is displayed in the domain dropdown. So if you want to add a domain for a particular feature class, it's stored in the geodatabase in such a way that you can just access it and say, OK, I want to apply this domain to this feature class. The description um, also allows for, for additional information. So you can add more information, why it's in place. You can be really, really descriptive with it. Then the field type, this tells you what kind of data you're bringing in. So it could be short, long, float, double, uh, text, integer, date, <laughs> go on and on and on. So it does, it gives us that limited, instead of, um, so for example, if you're going in and you're counting the number of chairs in a, an auditorium, you can only have an integer number of chairs in an auditorium. You cannot have a fraction of them. So you wouldn't want to double or float. You would want an integer for that. And you could force it so that you, they cannot put in any decimals. The other one is a domain type. So there's coded and there's range. Coded means that I can say, you know, it, let's say I have, I go in and I want to see what kind of food they have. And it's like, okay, this is a particular restaurant. Is it an international restaurant? Or, um, is it a, a burger joint? Is it a cafe? And I can actually choose those names from there. And I can set those. I can actually create them for my, my map. Also, then there's range so that allows me to say I want values from 0 to 10, 0 to 50. It can only be from 10 to 25. So I can set that. So here's, again, a little bit more description on coded domains. So it can apply to any attribute type. So you can set certain dates. So maybe you've gone out and collected data on a certain date, and that's all you can do is fill it in with that date um, or during a certain time of day that you went and collected it. You can specify the a valid set of values. So we can say I only want a certain value of it. I can set ranges. I can say, okay, the values are between 0 and 10, or they're between 0 and 20, or sorry, 10 and 20, or between 21 and 30, and we, I can set that. So what it does is it allows us to set from, to choose from a predefined value. So you get like a little drop down list and you just say, okay, this one, this is the one I'm going to use. So it really restricts the user to what's in that drop down list. It won't allow you to do any more. So we can see in this example here, under code, we have public, private, and employees. So those are the only three that I would be able to choose in this access type for building access. So then the user would have to actually choose one of those as they bring in the data. 
Range domains, again, I've mentioned this already, it gives me a range of values, of numerical values. So I set a minimum and I set a maximum and it can be applied to anything that is that is numerical. So I can do it with dates, times, integers, floats, doubles, all the different kinds. So the split and merge policies that are you're able to set with the within the domains. Um, so it, these are are ways to when you're doing analysis, what you can do. So with the split policy, um, this one occurs when features are split. So there's three kinds of policies. There's the default, the duplicate, and the geometry ratio. So the default, it just says the split attribute takes on the default value. So if I set a default value I take and I split that, it's going to end up with a default value. If I duplicate it, then the split attribute takes on the copy of it. So I can say, don't change. So if my attribute says that the 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 restaurant is a cafe, then it's going to be a cafe. Otherwise, the default value might be it's a burger joint. So it might be incorrect. So we might want to make sure that it's a duplicate. And the last one is a geometry ratio. So these ones are a ratio of the, the original feature. And that means that we actually have values. We have to have numerical values to do a ratio. So if the geometry of the, the features, when this, the feature is split into two, for example, or three, that the entire geometry gets that new attribute is, is assigned that. So if I have a value of 100 and in one like polygon, we're going to use a polygon, for example, and maybe I split that polygon into two and it's equally like the actual geometry is perfectly equal, then I'll get half the value. So each of them will have a new attribute that is 50. But if I split it into four, then it's going to be 25 for each of them. But if the geometry is not equal, then it will actually use the, the ratio of each side and it will assign that value to each of those. Then there's merge policies. So this is when my features are merged or combined. So I can, again, sometimes we will do that and we'll have um, a feature that makes more sense if it's combined together. So a good example would be a forest. I might have coniferous and deciduous trees. And then maybe I just want it to be a forest, so then I have to actually combine them together. So there's three merge policies for that. There's default, sum, and geometry. So the, the default is that it takes on whatever the default value, so it might be just trees, for example, right? Instead of saying coniferous and deciduous, it's now just a tree. A sum value is when we have actual numerical values, so it takes on that and it adds it together. So what if I said that there was 10 um, coniferous trees and 10, or sorry, 15 deciduous trees, then I would have 25 and it would just add them together. The last one is geometry weighted. So again, I would add them together, um, but I would weight them based on how big it is based on the, the spatial area rather than um, just adding them together. So there's also subtypes, which is another type of um, information that you'll see in geodatabases. So a subset of features in a feature class or table that share the same attributes. So I go through and I can identify and say, for example, I want a particular type of road. And that road, um, I can look up that and I can actually pull all of the features out of a great big table that only have that particular attribute, which is you know maybe a regular road. And then, um, or like a four lane highway. So I pull that out and I be, now have a subtype of that table. It's really good for creating that. So I can say, okay, I want to know what data on my map is, is this particular type. So it's very easy to categorize. It also allows me to set defaults in a, in a field. So that allows me to prevent any, anything from being left empty. And then I can also apply coded and range domains to those as well. So I can, again, limit any errors that could come up. So as a summary, the file geodatabases are advantage or like are advantage, advantages, <laughs> advantageous. It, it's one of these days that I just can't pronounce things. Advantageous to us uh, because we can have everything organized really nicely with spatial and non-spatial data. We have tables and rasters and everything's kind of all com combined. We can also store domains and subtypes to avoid any errors for anybody entering data. 
And then the domains have additional rules for managing GIS data as well. So we can do merge and split policies. So that is a type of um, editing of our data. And so we can actually manage that as well so that there's no errors made. So again, this is all still in your managing vector and raster data. And it will go towards your assignment one. So there's my reference. And I look forward to, talk, to having the next lecture in Objective 4.